Gaijin Entertainment presents The Shooting Range You are watching The Shooting Range, a weekly show for old tankers, airmen, and aspiring captains in War Thunder. In this episode, a heavyweight flak. What happens when Germans combine a heavy half-track and an 88mm cannon? The Kika, or the story about that time when the Japanese were better at engineering than their German counterparts. Hotline. The developers answer questions that you left in the comments. But first, let's start with a guide to some typical situations in the air-to-air -air combat. In one of our previous episodes, we discussed some basic tactics that could be useful to any tanker. Today, it's time to soar up into the skies and speak about planes. Just imagine, you're on the Lavichkin LA-5 and then there's the enemy Focke-Wulf trying to boom and zoom you. Let's try to let the opponent pass overhead and then greet him in a suitably manly fashion. With a healthy dose of lead, that is. The main thing now is to disorient the enemy pilot. Do a couple of corkscrew barrel rolls, play with your rudder, Keep a close eye on the enemy, though. When the attacker stops shooting and starts to climb or roll to the side, mirror his movements and open fire. Just don't forget to lead the shot. If everything is done correctly and luck is on your side, the opponent won't have enough time to get away. Boom! And not her victory mark in the bag. Now let's talk about surviving a head-on engagement. Alas, you'll often find yourself outmatched and lacking in firepower. But nobody says that you have to get into a fight you can't win. Try this. Go under the enemy plane. Three to four hundred meters is usually enough. And then mess with your opponent's aim by making your flight as unpredictable as possible, with the help of barrel rolls and wide banking turns. Okay, the enemy is left in the dust, and we can get back to all the fun stuff. Finally, there is a piece of advice for those who actually enjoy head-on attacks and don't mind shooting with stealth ammo belts. Today we'll teach you how to blow your enemies out of the sky at the distances of more than one kilometer. Take an aircraft with good guns, let's say the Lavichkin LA-7. The enemy is flying a Messerschmitt. You're closing the distance fast. Do you see the name of the enemy aircraft? Visualize a line right under it. That is where you should aim. When you're at roughly 1300 meters to your target, open fire and spray the enemy with lead in a slightly downward motion. Now it's time to jink away, or you'll have to participate in a lead-eating contest as well. A lot of players do not expect to be fired upon at such a distance and only open fire at around 800 meters. And that's what makes them easy prey. Try it yourself. Taking a recovery vehicle and turning it into a platform for artillery doesn't sound like the best of plans, but apparently it is, if you're German. Even the fiercest of fighters sometimes want to sit back and relax, while still maintaining a solid frag count, of course. But what do you do when you need to get there? Sell your soul to a vengeful war god? Memorize the teachings of Nispo, Revernenko, and Billot line by line? Maybe there's a special vehicle with a doomsday weapon attached to it. Well, not exactly, but we have a solid contender. Look at this heavy tractor. It has an 88mm gun that will make a tiger proud and takes only 5 seconds to reload and all that on a Rank 2 vehicle. This monstrous creation of Teutonic Engineers is so hardcore that we don't even dare to pronounce its full name. So we'll just call it this heavyweight flak half-track, alright? This heavyweight flak half-track is great at dealing with heavy bombers, but with a gun like this, it would be a waste not to save a few shells for ground targets. Oh yes, just think about it. It is a Rank 2 vehicle and it penetrates 130 millimeters of armor from 500 meters. When you're riding this half-tracked flak cannon, there is no rush. Find yourself a spot where you can see the main avenues of approach, choose a good elevation angle, get comfortable, and here you go. If you can get a good spot and you're able to aim and time shots well, a frag every five seconds is well within the realm of possibility. You need to get away and the half-track is a tad too slow? Well, ask a buddy to tow you around. Now you can rain destruction at your enemies while moving from one position to another at a considerable speed.
Of course, this vehicle has its flaws, limited ammunition for one, which makes it quite impossible to destroy the whole enemy team on your own. Jokes aside, your gun crew has zero protection and therefore is fair game to any vehicle in the field. Pay extra attention to artillery strike alerts. Whenever you hear that dreaded sound, run for your life. Another problem is that this heavy flak isn't really known for good gun depression, quite the opposite actually. Because of that, you'll often have no chance but to expose yourself, put yourself into the line of fire. This can be helped though, so bite the bullet. In other respects, this vehicle is quite good. A six-man crew and sturdy bulletproof armor means that it can take at least some punishment, and the formidable 88mm gun performs splendidly at its rank. Just remember that this German contraption is far from unbeatable. It offers a change of pace and can be quite devastating in the hands of a skilled tanker. But that's all it does. Now let's get back to World War II, we're going to tell you a story about two jet fighters that were very similar and yet couldn't be more different. Today our pages of history are going to be somewhat weird. That's because we're going to speak about not one, but two planes. The Japanese Nakajima J-8N Kika and the German ME-262 Schwalbe. It is often said that the first Japanese jet fighter was just a clone of the Schwalbe, the world's first operational jet fighter. But it's actually far from the truth. In terms of design, these are two vastly different planes. The first prototypes of the ME-262 hit the skies in 1941, immediately attracting the attention of the Japanese aircraft manufacturers. But there were no haste to follow in German footsteps. The designs of the Schwalbe were far from perfect. To put it simply, Willy Messerschmitt had his own way of designing aircraft. If a certain engineering solution or a design choice led to a serious problem with one of his planes, he did his best to avoid the solution in all his other projects, and vice versa. He tried to implement the same tried technologies and design ideas in all his aircraft, even when it wasn't exactly advisable. That was the problem with the ME-262. The newest fighter inherited a single spar wing from the successful ME-109. But this wing was never meant to carry heavy jet turbines. To avoid issues with plane balance, the designers had to outfit the fighter with a very modern swept wing, which wasn't ideal for a subsonic aircraft. The result was predictable. It all led to reduced maneuverability and an increased chance of stalling at low speeds. To make matters worse, the aircraft also got primitive slot flaps and needlessly massive slats, both of which made the fighter considerably heavier. All in all, it's not wrong to say that the first operational jet fighter in the world is also a good example of how you should not design an aircraft. But even with such a long list of flaws, the Schwalbe changed the skies the very moment the first such fighter engaged an enemy plane. The jet engine made such a difference that the ME-262 immediately became a force to be reckoned with. That's when the Japanese finally decided that they want a jet fighter of their own. But the Japanese plane makers still wanted to do things their own way. To start with, the new plane got two spar straight wings with well-designed slotted flaps. The fuselage cross-section was oval rather than triangular. Finally, compared to the ME-262, the Kika airframe was considerably smaller. The first test of the brand new jet fighter took place in 1945, when the American bombers had already raised the Japanese islands to the ground. The Kika only had time for one complete test flight before the prototype crashed due to a problem with rocket-assisted takeoff units. What's worth mentioning is that Susumu Takaoka, the pilot who manned the fighter at the moment, managed to crash land the aircraft without serious damage to the plane. All in all, the Kika, as we know it now, was quite a well-built aircraft with decent flying characteristics, but it didn't have enough time to prove itself. It's hardly fair, but when you look at the pages of history, this jet fighter is mostly remembered as a kind of an improved ME-262, a pale shadow of the well-known German jet fighter. Finally, it's time for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline, developers answering questions from the comments.
Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official forums. Here we'll have a more light-hearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. We we'll hope you like it. The first question comes from a player called Sir Noah. It goes like this. Are the Japanese tanks going to be added at the end of the year like the British and American tanks? We cannot give an exact date yet, but the Japanese tanks are coming. We even started to reveal them to the public, or at least some of them, like the Mitsubishi Type 95 Ha-Go or the Mitsubishi Type 97 Shinhoro Chiha. Stay tuned, Japan will get its ground vehicles soonish. There is another question from Lord of Orange. Will you add reloading animations for the crews of open-top vehicles? Nope, at least not in the foreseeable future. We understand that good looks are important, but the truth is, it doesn't add much value and takes quite a lot of time to do properly. And we want it to be done properly, that goes without saying. Besides, you'll be the first to tell us something along the lines of Hey, why are you wasting time on these animations when we're waiting for naval warfare and Japanese ground forces and also that bomber? Please don't forget about that bomber! Are we right? or not. Then, Ace Attorney Fan writes, PSVR is coming out soon. Does Gaijin have plans to make War Thunder compatible with PlayStation VR? OBJECTION! Uh, sorry, it was kinda hard to resist there. Yeah, and it's not just some plans, it is going to happen. Please remember that War Thunder is also compatible with Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. We are very excited about this technology. I hope you share our enthusiasm. And the last thing from a guy called Lucas Sedaitis. I bet you 100 years you won't read this comment. Pay up, buddy, or you can provide your whole squad with starter packs for naval combat so that we can work on it together. That works as well. This is it for the day, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range.